Hello everyone, my name is Anwan Simmons and I am here to give my presentation on managing the burnout burndown. But first I want to say I really was looking forward to making the trip to South Africa and being with all of you in person and I really hope to do that one day. But unfortunately due to the coronavirus I'm stuck here in Houston, Texas. So I'm giving you a pre-recorded version of my video it's pre-recorded, but it is still filled with love. All right, let's get to it. Managing the burnout burn down. You know, I've been involved in developing software applications for over 20 years, and there's just something really thrilling about turning ones and zeros into value for customers. And I'm sure that many of you got into building software for a living because you love the culture, the creativity, and the community that we can all enjoy in this industry. In fact, you've heard a lot of people in the media also understand that building software is awesome. And we've all heard the mythology of a couple of people in a garage building what are now multi-billion dollar industries. And then there's the thrill that any of us, any of you hearing this can build an app and it can be on people's phones and used every day by millions of people. And that's really exciting. And I think that it's wonderful that software development has gotten such a cool factor in our industries. However, there is a side of software development that is not often talked about in the media. Building software can be exhausting. Now, a lot of people are surprised by this because building software isn't like building a building, right? Or doing construction. Many of you are sitting in some building that people came in and they had to clear the land and pour concrete and put up steel and hang drywall and create the framework for lighting and, and electricity. And so that's manual labor. And building software doesn't have that manual labor, but there is a cost to building software. Building software puts a mental and psychological burden on software engineers, testers, and even the managers who lead software engineering efforts. We work in an industry that places a number of demands on us. Software constantly evolves and we always have to worry that the things that we know now aren't enough to tackle the challenges in the future. In fact, if you're like me, then a lot of the software languages and the tools that were state of the art when you started your career aren't even being used today. And so there's often that never ending pressure to keep improving yourself, to keep up, to not fall behind. And that is a lot of demand on software engineers. There's also the demand to always churn out features to our customers. Many of you have heard the term always be shipping. And I know I've used that term to motivate my teams because if you're constantly shipping valuable features to your users, then you're always defending the value of the engineering team. However, always, can be exhausting. In fact, any system that is always on will fail. And there's actual research that documents the burden that building software puts on software development teams. And I, in fact, stand before you as a repeat victim of burnout. I've been there. I've been at the end of my rope, physically exhausted by everything that goes into building software because I don't just build software 24 hours a day. I am like all of you, a human being and I have families and friends and different things that demand my time. And I know I've seen the stress in my life and the impact of building software on my family and every development team that I've led has also had to deal with stress and the effect that burnout has put on those teams. Because the truth is, if you don't regulate the burnout level of yourself, and if your team does not regulate its own burnout uh, levels, then you will see 
this reflected in the daily work of your team. In fact, burn out people burn out. They burn down valuable things like culture by becoming argumentative and they have short fuses and you can almost see the stress on them. Also, they burn down architectures and you'll see them beginning to install frameworks that, e that aren't even on your technical roadmap because they're trying to distract themselves by how stressed out they are. They also burn down quality by introducing more and more bugs over time. And you can almost see the bug reports grow from engineers who typically did not have to deal with a lot of bugs to make you more and more bugs over time. And often that is a symptom of burnout. So they not only burn down things, but they go out. Uh, they go out of source control systems and they make fewer and fewer commits and fewer and fewer more comments on pull requests. And again, you almost see the trend of people withdrawing from wherever you house your software repository. Uh, they also go out of team interactions and you'll see them, if you have daily standups, being more and more quiet and making fewer and fewer comments during standups. And you'll also see them go out of the tools that we use to communicate. They often aren't as talkative in tools like Slack. And if burnout goes unchecked for long enough, you'll see it start to hurt your ability to deliver software. In fact, always be shipping will turn to always be slipping as you begin to slip date after date as you deal with your team struggling with burnout. Now, I want to go into the problem statement to very clearly share with all of you that there is a real cost to not managing burnout. And normally my wife uh, does this part of the presentation with me. We've given it before uh, many audiences, uh, but I'm going to go through uh, the research that shows that burnout is not something that just happens to one or two people or a few teams here and there, uh, but it is a rampant challenge that we all have to deal with. However, before we go further, I want to make sure we all have a really crisp working definition of burnout. So if you go to the June 2016 issue of Word Psychiatry, you'll find this definition of burnout. And I'm just gonna read this. Burnout is a psychological syndrome emerging as a prolonged response to chronic interpersonal stressors on the job. The three key dimensions of burnout or of this response are overwhelming exhaustion, feelings of cynicism and detachment from the job and a sense of ineffectiveness and lack of accomplishment. Now, that's a mouthful. That's a very clinical definition. And so my wife and I, when we were writing this talk, we wanted to come up with a working definition of burnout. And we came up with this. Burnout is the ongoing feeling that today's resources aren't enough to meet tomorrow's demands. And many of you have felt that. You've come to the end of every day wondering, am I on top of my stuff? Or I just feel like I'm falling more and more behind. And what I'm here today, to, what I wanna do today is discuss how burnout affects the people uh, who are part of software development teams, but it is a problem that spans multiple industries. Now, I do want to go and take a deeper dive into the three dimensions of burnout, right? So that's emotional exhaustion. And that's just an overall lack of energy and a sense that you don't have the resources to make it through your day. Uh, that's when you often come to the end of your day feeling that you have nothing left to give. Then there is depersonalization. That's the feeling that the people around you are no longer people because you can't see their humanity due to your own stress. It's almost like if you ever had a friend who was in a car accident and then you hear that they're in an emergency room and so you go to them and you say, hey, I'm looking for my friend. And then the nurse at the station says, oh, the car accident, they're in room two. Right? They don't say your friend's name or acknowledge their humanity, but that person has reduced your friend to simply a problem to be dealt with. That is what happens when you are affected by depersonalization. And then there's the feeling of reduced 
personal accomplishment. That's when you begin to feel that even the work that you get done isn't enough. And you begin to degrade the value of what you produce and become overly critical uh, of your work. And you begin to criticize yourself. Now, I'm sure that as I've gone through these three parts of burnout, these three dimensions, you've begun to think, yeah, I've been there. I've, I've seen the exhaustion. I've seen my, uh, myself begin to really beat myself up, even though I'm doing just a full day of work every day. Uh, then you've gone through some of the dimensions of burnout. All right. But burnout is widespread. You're not alone. It's extremely common in multiple industries. In fact, uh, Gallup did a, a three-part series uh, earlier the, in, in 2019 uh, about burnout. And what did it show? It showed that out of 7,500 full-time employees, um, that 23% reported being burned out um, very often, and 44% said they felt burned out sometimes. So that means that almost two thirds of full time workers experience some degree of burnout. Two thirds, that's 66%. That is def definitely the majority of people. And if you're in that hallway and you see people next to you, uh, most of them have gone through this. Most of them have experienced some degree of burnout, whether they work in software or, or in any other industry. Not only that, but a lot of people feel that, hey, my workers are engaged. We hang out here at the office. We have a pool table. We have uh, kegs full of beer in the break room. We bring in lunch. Um, well, before Corona, that's what we did. And we just had this great environment and everyone is active in Slack and we have all these great emojis and all this fun uh, in what we do. Everyone is engaged. There's no way that we have to deal with burnout. Well, on the contrary, the University of Cambridge did a study that found that the people who seem the most engaged are often the people who are at the highest risk of burnout. And that means that the people who are in Slack, they're on Zoom, they're always around the office, they're doing all the things and being highly visible in your company, those are often the people who are planning their exit. And this study found that the highest turnover intentions, meaning, meaning the, 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 the determination that I'm leaving this job, came from the people who were the most highly engaged. So highly engaged people are not a solution to burnout. In fact, they, they may be the people who are in most need of support. So we talked about the fact that burnout is very widespread, but I wanna really clearly talk about the cost of burnout. And there are individual costs to burnout. And Mayo Clinic did a study that laid out the costs. So there is physical illness, and you can take people's blood pressure and you can measure their physical symptoms and then you'll see that this person is under stress. Then there is psychological distress that goes from simply being irritated to just blowing up at people around the office. And then there is the one of the higher costs is that people literally stay home sick and they don't even come to work. And some of them are even hospitalized because their stress and their burnout has caught up with them uh, and they have to be in a hospital just to be kept uh, alive. And that is obviously the extreme version, but this is something that I've seen members of my team go through where they literally have to go to the hospital, go to the emergency room to deal with burnout. So there aren't just individual costs, but there are corporate costs. Corporations pay a price for not addressing burnout. Uh, Harvard did a study uh, that showed that there are health cost implications for not managing burnout. In fact, they found that for 125 to 190 billion dollars a year, uh, which is five to eight percent of national spending on healthcare, is dealing with the ramifications of burnout. Uh, and that means that just the high demands at work. And again, this is not just in software industry, but people across the world are dealing with immense stress. And we can probably almost double that stress level due to the coronavirus that has changed our lives in ways that we don't even understand today. 
And so there is just an immense amount of stress with burnout. And we're obviously spending even more than what's on the slide in addressing helping people deal with what's happening uh, in this global pandemic. So because burnout is so common, there are often multiple ways that people go through to try to address it. I'm gonna go through some of those common solutions, but also go into why these common solutions often don't work. Now, many of you work in offices that have really plush layouts and they have games and snacks and exercise, uh, um, exercise equipment. And all that is really nice. And again, I've been fortunate as a, as a public speaker to go all over the world to speak at tech conferences. And so I've been to conferences, or I've been to the, the corporations in San Francisco. Uh, I've been to Atlanta where MailChimp is. I've been to uh, Budapest where Prezi's headquartered. And I've walked into these plus offices and in many ways, companies, especially well, software companies, they want to make their software engineers feel feel like royalty, right? We want to make them feel like kings and queens, like princes and princesses and all the people in between. We want to make their environment give the feeling that they're royalty. But you know what? Sometimes royalty ends up at the red wedding. And then all of the coffee machines and all of the free lunches won't be enough to deal with burnout. Not only that, but corporations operate with budgets as we're seeing today. And often when times get hard, the first thing that is cut from the budget are, are these perks. And so this is just not a reliable way to really help people uh, deal with burnout. And that's what corporations do to try to address burnout. But people also try to do things to address the burnout levels. And we see people go to excess by abusing food and drugs and alcohol, or people try to go through escapism and they're going to be like, you know what, I'm going to take a fun trip and I'm going to go somewhere, maybe on a beach and just get away from it all. But in a society with so much social media, uh, we make even vacations work. Uh, we often go on Instagram and post pictures to try to show how much I'm not working, right? So we make not working work. And we've, we've even heard reports of people trying to take that perfect picture and falling off the Grand Canyon or falling off mountains. And so there's even stress that we put on getting away from work. And we find that individuals often uh, don't have the ways or they're not equipped with the tools to adequately address burnout. So my wife and I, seeing that corporations were trying to address burnout, but not really able to do it effectively. And we saw that individuals also weren't very effective in addressing their own burnout. And so we wanted to create a framework that everyone could use and that also did not require a large degree of privilege uh, to bring to bear on people's personal lives. And so this was very important uh, for everyone to understand. Now, I call this uh, managing the burnout burndown because like many of you, I've been an engineering manager for a long time and I've used a burndown chart as a way to manage the work that my people do, just as a very easy way to understand uh, where the work is. I'm gonna quickly explain a burnout chart. You have the X axis, uh, which is time, uh, the Y axis, which represents work. And so in this example, we have 15 units of work. And then obviously the ideal line, which is if the team burns down or gets done a regular amount of work over the sprint, right, typically two weeks, then they will be on this line or under the line, right? And then over time, uh, the work goes down or maybe uh, above the line. But the idea is that we want to get the work down to zero, right? So what's underneath that shaded area is all the work that the team is burning down. And as I work with many teams and I looked at many burn down charts, I realized that as a, as a technical leader, I needed to do more than just burn down work. Um, I needed to burn down stress. 
I needed to burn down all the problems that were afflicting my team. And so my wife and I came out, came up with three things that everyone can burn down to, to manage your stress and avoid burnout. And so we're going to talk about what we can do to make sure that you have a very clear understanding of the actions you can take to manage your stress level um, and in really avoid burnout. And so I'm going to go through this framework and the three parts. And for everyone, I'm going to give you a couple ideas, but I'm always going to say the one thing you simply must do that if you don't hear anything else in this part of the framework, do this. So the first thing that you need to do to avoid burnout is burn down barriers. You have to have deep relationships. It's so important uh, that we make sure that the ties that bind us together, uh, that they are rich. And in our research into burnout, we've seen that strong human relationships are one of the best ways to make yourself burnout resistant, to make the stresses that you go through manageable. And it's very important that we begin to reduce the barriers between us, uh, that we try to have a, an environment of open discussion. And if you run a company, and especially if you're in HR, you have a lot of leeway in making a culture uh, that is rich and vibrant, but most importantly, open, that people feel that they can be vulnerable, uh, that they can uh that they can share the true nature of who they are and what they're going through. And I know I'm very fortunate to work at Help Scout uh, where we have a great culture, where we can be vulnerable with each other. And that has allowed us to burn down the barriers that are between us. Uh, and, and if you're a CEO or even a director, then you can do a lot to help your people also manage um, their relationships. Uh, you can you can incentivize people socializing with each other. Um, you can even give out gift cards that it's one gift card, but two people have to agree on what they're going to spend it on, right? And those are ways that you can invest in, in burning down the barriers between your people. But I do want to share one thing you simply must do, uh, and that is you have to have regular meetings with people in person. Now, Typically, when I give this uh, talk, we're not social distancing, so this is hard to do now. Uh, but if you can, if you're sheltering in place with someone, just you might be getting tired of them, but sit down with them in person. I've seen people in the same house, FaceTime from different rooms. You need to be in the same physical space for this to work. And one day this pandemic will be over, and I really think we all need to invest and getting off FaceTime and Zoom and all these ways of virtually meeting and meeting in person. And by doing that, you can talk about what's challenging you, what's stressing you out. And even if the people that you're meeting with in person can't solve your problem, just being able to talk about it will go a long way toward helping you manage your stress and avoid burnout. All right, the second part in our framework is burning down distractions. And that is the power of focus. We have an almost infinite number of things that can distract us uh, in our lives, right? There's all the social media platforms, there's all the news sources that we have, there's television, there's movies, there's so many things that can distract us, but we only have a finite amount of attention. Your attention is, is fixed. And once you burn out your, your ability to focus, your attention span, then you begin to become less efficient at not only processing information, but in actually getting things done. And then your ability to, to even fight off stress goes down. And in many ways, technology has blurred the lines between work and home. Uh, many years ago, when many of us worked in factories, you know, it was impossible to take your work home, right? Because you really can not take a Model T uh, home. But now we can take work home with us all the time. In fact, many of us work at home because work has become so portable. And so there's almost an unlimited menu of things uh, that drain our attention. But it's critical that we learn the power of no. 
You know, there's probably only one or two things that are really important to you right now. One or two things that you can meaningly, meaningfully make progress on. And it's really important that we understand what are our values? What are the things that are really important to us? And that can be work, that can be at home, but get a great sense of what's really important to you and heavily invest all of your time and all of your attention on those things that are really valuable to you. And, and it's really important uh, that, that, that we do that. And, you know, companies can help do this uh, by making sure that the people at the company have a very clear list and a very strong idea of what's really important to the company. I've seen so many companies where they have their list of values on their website and it's like 13 things or it's 10 things and most people can't remember two things. We have to be more lean. We have to identify what's really important, uh, what's really valuable to us, both as corporations and as people and put our entire attention, our limited attention on those things. That probably means limiting who you follow on Twitter and Instagram and other social media and only following people whose, whose feedback, whose, what they post on social media truly aligns with what we feel is important. Now, the one thing you simply must do, and this is maybe difficult for many of you to do, take a break from social media. And I mean a total break. I recommend a month. Uninstall Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. I see some of you trembling and shaking. It's okay, you can do this. But by taking a break from social media, you'll find so much more just mind space open up to you. I mean, you'll feel a weight lifted. And if you can't do a month, then at least try, maybe just say, okay, for an hour a day, I'll get my fix my social media fix, and then I'm gonna be off it for the rest of the day. That is so important to open up space for you to be able to focus on what's really important to you. All right, the final part of our framework is burning down illness, focusing on your health. You know, in many ways, software, develop, software developers, uh, we trade health for productivity. Uh, we don't sleep the way that we should. We don't eat the way that we should. And often we do things that damage our health just to get that next feature done or to try to solve that bug. Uh, but the reality is that when you trade away your health, you're going to eventually have health debt, just like tech debt, that's going to eventually come back and get you. So it's very important that we truly take a take a an inventory of, of our health uh, and really invest in ourselves. And you know, there are a few things that you can do, right? One, get enough sleep, stay hydrated, um, try to exercise. And I know these are things that aren't groundbreaking, but so often uh, we do give up our health uh, for our jobs. And you know, companies can invest in their people by offering things like a free yoga or in these times, a subscription to a yoga a set of videos where people can uh, you learn yoga or learn to exercise uh, through distance learning. But the one thing that you simply must do uh, is take walks. And I know many of us are sheltering in places, are sheltering in place, uh, and it's hard to get out, but you can probably take a walk and you may need to stay, uh, keep your distance from people, but a walk around the block can do wonders for your health. I know my wife and I started taking walks together every day uh, after dinner, and it's a small investment in your long-term health. And so I think start small, walk around the block once a day, maybe expand it to two blocks or walk to the parking walk back. Uh, but by doing that, you're gonna be investing in your health uh, and burning down illness. Now, I've gone over a lot, but I do wanna go over a couple of things. I wanna bring this chart back up and I mentioned the ideal line. Uh, and that is if the team perfectly burns down their work this is what is a guide for that. But I've learned over time by working with many engineering teams that it's okay if we are not under the ideal line, if we're a little bit behind in where we need to, to, to be, uh, because I know that we're going to eventually catch up. I know my teams, I know their performance, and if we're not ideal for a while, uh, that's okay. And that applies to burnout as well. You can burn out trying to avoid burnout, 
But the key is that we learn uh, to balance it all out. That practice is better than perfection. And these burnout resistance practices that I shared with you, they're things that take time. And don't stress out if you try a few things and you don't get a chance to actually do it, it doesn't become a habit yet. Habits take time. It's okay for this to take time. And it's also okay for there to be periods in your life where your relationships aren't where they should be, or your health isn't where it needs to be, or you're having trouble being focused because you just have a lot that's on your plate. The key is to keep trying. The key is to take stock every now and then, and I recommend at least once a month to just meet with yourself and just say, okay, how am I doing with taking those walks? How am I, how, how am I doing with maintaining relationships? How am I doing with discarding all of the junk that's coming my way and really focus on what's valuable? And then keep making small iterative changes and improvements and over time, this framework will begin to really work for you and you'll begin to see that no matter how much stress is coming your way, you can manage it. And that is the key to avoiding burnout. Now, this three-part framework is meant to be a way for you to be equipped to manage burnout. And I really hope that you have found that you can guard your heart, your mind, and your body and really become more productive. Uh, and not only for yourself, but model more a more healthy way of going about life uh, to your colleagues and even the people in your personal life. I've always believed that building software requires motivated individuals. And by reaching out and removing distractions and, revital and, and revitalizing yourself, uh, you're going to improve what you can deliver to your company, but also to yourself. I believe and I know that healthy teams make healthy code and burning down burnout will help you be become a healthy member of your team. So I'll be rooting for you as you burn down the stresses in your life so that you can be the best version of yourself, both at work and at home. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, this is my wife who I typically uh, do this with. Uh, this is how you can contact her, contact me on Twitter. I would love to connect with all of you and keep up with what you're doing to manage your stress and avoid burnout. DevConf, it's been lovely. I wish you all well. Take care. <laughs> Hello, everyone. This is N1 Simmons. Thank you for watching my pre-recorded talk. I'm sorry I could not be there. I had some work meetings that got in the way of me doing my talk live, but I hope you really enjoyed the pre-recorded version. And if you have any questions, I'm here. Uh, you're going to post your questions and then they will be sent to me and I will respond. So uh, if you can cue those up, then that would be great. So just to kind of give you a little bit more time, I am in Houston, Texas. I am born and raised in the USA. I've been to Africa before. I was in Nigeria when I was last there, but that was 20 years ago. I was so looking forward to going back to the great continent and spending time in Joburg and Cape Town, but unfortunately it was not meant to be. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, share them with me and I will absolutely fill them. I'm doing a quick check of the Slack. And I see uh, Kirsten uh, waving, Eon waving. Hello. Thank you for uh, watching my, my stream. And uh, waiting for the first question. All right. I have a question, I believe, from JP Roussel. I hope that's how you pronounce your name. And it says, in terms of obtaining a healthier team, do you have any recommendations on how to achieve this for people who aren't active or sports people? <clears throat> That's a great question. So, uh, 
you know, one thing that I've learned about leading teams, and I've led a lot of software development teams over 20 plus years doing this, is that they are all different. And they're different in terms of personality. Some are introverts, some are extroverts, some love to have you know exactly what they're doing. Some are like, leave me alone and I'll get my work done and I'll tell you where I am uh, next month. And that applies to their level of activity and their either ability to be involved in physical activity uh, or, or, or not. And one thing as a leader is that I have to be flexible, right? One thing as a leader is that I have to be able to flex for what my team needs. And I've learned that, you know, there's really only one me, one manager, one leader, and there's a lot of them. And so it's really incumbent on me to be flexible. So that means that even when someone may not be as keen to be involved uh, in, in, act, in, in being active or in sports teams, then I try to find some way. And it could be just like, hey, you know, when we have our, our one-on-one, and, and I think one-on-one is a very well understood term, but for those who don't know, I meet with everyone on my team one-on-one, which is a, let's not talk about work. Let's just see, hey, how are you? And what are your thoughts about your career? And what can I do as your manager to make your career here more successful? And I might do uh, a walking one-on-one where instead of sitting in a corner, this is, of course, assumes that we're co- co- uh, co-located, right, in the same physical space, then uh, we'll do a walk and, and I'll modify it to their pace and we'll just do our one-on-one while walking on a couple of blocks. Um, or if we are not in the same physical space and a lot of people now learning about remote work. Uh, then we may say, hey, you know, I'll walk around my block. And then if you, if, if your time zone supports it, why don't you go for a walk and then we'll walk that way. And so um, there are ways to um, to make our work and the work that I do with my team one where there's a little bit of physical a- activity. And sometimes it's just modeling. It's just saying, hey, um, uh, in Slack, for lunch, I'm taking a hike. And I'll be back in an hour. And so by modeling that, then that usually is a way to do it. All right. So thank you, uh, JP, for that question. Uh, The next question is, is there anything you can do to help a colleague who is experiencing uh, burn? It says burn down, but I think you meant burn out. I think that there are a lot of things that you can do to help a colleague who is experiencing burnout. One is just being aware of what normal is. Typically, as a manager, I work with teams for, if not a couple of years, at least several months. And so it's very important that as a manager, I observe my team and I get a sense of what is their just normal profile, right? If they typically, you know, bound into work and they're really active in Slack or if they make, you know, long detailed PRs or comments on, on PRs then you get a sense of what are they like normally. And then when you see a change, when you see, wow, I haven't seen them in Slack for a couple of days or their PRs went from being well-detailed and easy to understand to being um, just one or two sentences that I don't know what's going on. And so having an idea, uh, either you know, as a manager or a colleague, then that is a good way to have a baseline and then seeing they've they've diverged from that baseline. And also, it's very important, and again, I, I, a lot of what I'm sharing with you is as a manager, I've been a, 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 an engineering manager for a long time, is you have to dig your well before you're thirsty. And by that, I mean that you have to form a relationship with the people uh, before you need that relationship to assist you in accomplishing some goal. So, if I have a baseline understanding of my someone who works for me or a colleague, and then I have a relationship, I can have that conversation and say, hey, you know, I've noticed this and this, and that doesn't seem to be you. Let's talk about that. And then once you are able to have that relationship, you can say, okay, you know, what can I do to either take your workload off or shift things around and make it easier for you because you're going through something? Or what can I do to facilitate relationships within the team or what can I, what can I do 
to see what can I, how can I help you become more healthy? And so a lot of the things in my talk, whether it's helping them with the relationships or, or focus uh, or helping them with their health, then I can begin to apply those items. So that's what I would say, helping a colleague who has experienced burnout. Uh, and you got to have that baseline understanding of how they normally are. Uh, and you have to also understand um, how is the relationship you have with that person. Hopefully it's strong before you need it. All right. There are a few more questions. So let's see. All right. I have a question. So that question about a colleague experiencing burnout was by Timothy Spring. Uh, Chris, Kirsten uh, Marchant. As, is asking, do you have any further tips for junior devs who still need to work hard to make a name? So not sure if the reduced personal accomplishment is actual underperformance. So uh, Kirsten, I think what you're saying is that you have someone who is a junior dev, so they're trying to have a good body of work um, so that they uh, can become a, a senior dev. That's how I interpret uh, what you're saying there. And I think that uh, there are times when, yes, you are absolutely right, where you're not being hard on yourself. You're just not very good right now. And that's a conversation that you have to have where um, you have to be able to understand and explain to a junior dev, hey, here's the bar, right? Here's the bar for uh, writing good quality code, writing pull requests that the team can understand. Um, here is the uh, bar for when we deploy code to production and we have to revert it because there was some issue. You have to outline very clearly what are the requirements for the job. And it has to be something that's not personal. It's just like, hey, every engineer on this team has to be at this bar. And then you're having the conversation about, you know, what, this is where the bar is. And then this is where you're, you're, you are performing. And, and that way you can have an easy conversation based on data and not based on their internal views of how they feel about their work or maybe even about you. And so as a manager, it's very important that the standards for the role, and that's junior devs, senior devs, uh, staff engineers, that we all have a very clear understanding of what's required. Um, and so that that way we can have an honest conversation about where that person is. Thank you, Kirsten, for the question. Question from Simone. How should I approach a colleague that I think is burning out? Very similar to what I was saying before, but I would say, don't go to that colleague and say, you, you look burnt out. <laughs> That's probably not very effective. I think that a better way is to one, try to have that relationship. If you don't have a relationship, with that colleague, then you're not really well positioned to be engaged with this person and helping them. So I would say find someone else who has that relationship and then share what you've observed and then that person's empowered. But if you have the relationship, then relationships lubricate conflict. And conflict can be something, and I say conflict because talking about someone being burned out can be a touchy subject. They may have something going on in their personal life that they don't want you to actually know about or even talk about. So you have to be very careful. But I think you, if you have the right relationship, you have to be able to go in with just observations. You know, this is what I've observed. Don't make value judgments. Don't make assumptions. But say, I've observed that you typically are here every day by nine o'clock in the morning. You're coming in at 1030 now. Or, hey, you used to not have any bugs uh, when we would have to test your code, but you're just generating a lot of defects now. And just ask, what do you think is going on, right? Don't try to bring the answer to them. Uh, just say, here's what I've observed, and then help them find the answers inside themselves. And then typically, um, I think you'll get pretty good results. So Simone, I hope that that helped. Uh, what do you do if you've hit burnout already? Uh, what do you do with underperformers? Do you try to motivate them? I think, uh, Warner, thank you for the question. I think that if you've hit burnout already, um, it's very important to, one, acknowledge that you are exhibiting, right, the, the traits of burnout. You're just physically exhausted. Um, you begin to, you know, beat yourself up for work. That's actually pretty good, but you don't see it 
as being very good. Um, you're beginning to argue with your teammates and be and have a very short fuse with them. I think that you have to interrogate the reality of, of your life and what you're doing. And then you have to have an honest conversation with your manager and saying, hey, these are things that I'm going through. And again, just describe the behaviors and say, I need space for this. And I hope you're working in a company that has a culture where that will be supported and you'll be able to um, get support for maybe taking um, a couple of days off or finding some way uh, to say, I need some time to just really pull myself together. Um, or uh, if you have someone who's not performing, I think, like I said before, uh, you have to differentiate between underperformance and, and burnout. And by having a set of standards that are well documented and understood by the team, you can differentiate between those two things. Um, motivating people who are burnt out, that varies by person to person. Some people just need time. Some people uh, do want to talk about it. And so having the ability to have honest conversations uh, can be motivating. And I found that often as a manager, uh, I just listen, right? A big part of my job is listening. And I've literally sat with someone and they talk for 20 minutes and I really am just nodding and smiling. And they're like, oh, I feel much better. And then all I did was listen. And, uh, and often, uh, you, you know, you will be surprised how many people just want to be heard. All right. Uh, Jert, I think is, is it Jert or Gert? I think it's Jert. Um, I'm a junior developer. I started working four months ago. I am burned out completely. I'm sorry to hear that. How does one approach something like this as it's obvious I should not be burned out so early? I'm not the team lead. So how does one approach your team to try and implement something like this? Yeah, um, great question. I think that we often think that one, burnout is just due to, to work. And we're all human beings and we have much more going on in our lives than what we do at work. We have obviously friends and family or maybe personal hobbies or you know different things that, that can burn us out. Uh, besides work. So I wouldn't be surprised that you're burned out so early. There might be things going on uh, outside of work that you're trying to manage. And I would say that, um, you know, try to figure out what's happening with you. And I think it's probably uh, not just work. I don't know where you work, Jert, but I would say talk to your manager, have an honest conversation and and try to bring data, right? And you, you, you'll, you all have heard me say, bring data, say, look, I'm having trouble focusing right now, or, um, you know, I'm, I'm having trouble understanding what I need to do to make this code work properly, or, you know, this is a big legacy system, and I've been struggling in it. Help me understand who I can talk to, uh, to have a better go at it. Or, you know, there are things happening in my personal life that I just need some time, and hopefully your manager, again, you have a culture where they can say, you know what, let's try to reduce and, and focus, right, that, that the power of focus, and just say, look, you know, don't worry about all of this and this code base or whatever's happening, uh, but let's just focus on this thin sliver of things that I think is well suited to your skill set, and then we'll give you time to grow and develop. So um, I, what I would say is that um, I hope you have a manager and a culture that are supportive. I've had uh, my developers come to me and say I'm struggling, and I'm I'm happy to have those conversations and make space for them uh, to address whatever's going on with them personally, or or just say, look, I won't work to be the the uh, the the smallest thing in your life that you have to worry about, and so I'll make changes uh, and I'll buy time with my management layer uh, to help this person out. All right, uh, Parfait, how do you effectively communicate to clients that you are, uh, that, you are pre that are pressuring you to always deliver the need to burn down? Burn yeah, and so um, I've worked uh, for a consulting company before, right? And I work for Help Scout, so we make our own in-house software. And, uh, but when I work for Accenture and Deloitte, then I'm very well aware of the model of there are clients who... <laughs> don't really care about you. They're, they just, you know, you're being billed um, for, for work. And so I would say that um, it's very important that you, um, if you are managing a team and there's an outside client, um, then you really have to say, look, you know, there's something happening with the team. Um, and, you know, we can hopefully either switch out someone or backfill someone. 
But, you know, our first priority is the health of our people and our work will be positively benefited if we make sure we have the healthiest team possible. And hopefully have a client uh, who respects what you've done. And if you have a track record of delivering projects, then you'll get space for that. And I've been in situations where um, I, I, I've been able to tell my client, and I've said this in my talk, uh, healthy teams build healthy code. And we're having to do a few things right now to get our team into a healthier spot. And I think if you lead with that, uh, you'll typically get uh, pretty good results. All right, so I have a couple, I have several more questions. Um, Katie, how, how am I doing with time? I don't know if you can type it in chat. Because I actually have 20 minutes to go, so I can keep going. And I don't see anything from Katie. So give me a second. I'm seeing something. Uh, okay. You know what? I'm going to keep going in, unless until I hear otherwise. All right. So great questions. All right. So next question from Buhaki, I believe. How does one manage burnout, especially for a more senior person who your team players depend on you? And your team people are different and learn di and learn different. So you have to manage all of them, right? So I think what you're saying is, hey, you know, I'm one of the most senior developers on this team. A lot of people rely on me to give them guidance for their code. They rely on me to um, help them figure out what's happening, to even explain the business reasons that we're doing this. Um, and so you're saying that, you know, I don't have any room to give. And what I would say in that situation is that uh, your body will always remember. <laughs> your body will always tell you the truth. And while you may be an important member of the team, uh, you're going to just degrade your performance if you don't take care of yourself. And I've seen it over again. I've been doing this for a very long time. Um, we often underestimate the impact that our physical selves have on our work. And so you may be that senior developer uh, and maybe you've been there for several years. Um, you know, at some point, if you don't take care of yourself, you're going to break down. And I said this during the talk, any system that is always on will fail. So what I would say in this example is uh, you need to do at least two things. One is uh, if you're that much of a bottleneck in people's performance, you need to spread knowledge. You need to help people understand, look, I, I'm going to train a few people uh, and, and impart the things that I know as a senior development. And a lot of that is just the history of the code base. And I'm going to help them to get upskilled up so that there's less pressure on me. And then the second thing is, look, I need to take a day and maybe it's one day a week to just, you know, be either heads down or, you know, turn off Slack, turn off email. If you really need me, then there's this emergency way that you can get to me. Um, and just let yourself focus. And that way you're freeing up mind space, um, which will help you very well on the other day. So I would say that when I've seen someone who says, hey, I'm senior, I don't have any room to give. Typically life will force you to give. So get ahead of that and then upskill the people around you, help them become more senior. Uh, and then, then you're less of a bottleneck. All right, uh, Peter, uh, what are healthy ways to not fall behind and not put more too much pressure on yourself? I would say that you really need to understand what are the true values that you have um, that that you bring you know to the company, and then what are the true values that 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 your skill set can be tied to? And you know, we always want to think that we're good at everything and we do everything really well, but typically. <laughs> There's only one or two things you're really good at. And, and what I would say is to not fall behind. The best way is to really fall back and say, look, I really feel that my main contribution to this company is, is really these two areas. And I'm going to just withdraw from everything else. And again, a, a, a lot of my um, answers assume that you do have a great culture and a great relationship with the people in leadership at your company. And just have honest conversations about what you think you're really good at and just say, look, I'm going to do these one or two things and I'm going to, you know, let everything else go and at least give me a month or maybe a quarter to just do these things so that I can really uh, focus on my strengths. Uh, when I was in 
grad school getting my MBA, we did something called Strengths Finder, uh, which is a test that you can take and it'll tell you that here are the things that you're really strong in. Um, and the general guidance from Strengths Finder is we waste a lot of time on things that we're not really strong in, and then therefore we have a lot of pressure and we begin to feel burned out when you really need to just focus on what you're really good at. And that's typically not 20 things, it's probably two things. Uh, all right, and so Bradley's asking, as a leader, I feel like I could be the only one burning out. My team seems very relaxed and unfazed. Is burnout a curse of leadership? <laughs> You know, like they say, uh, heavy is the crown that wears it. Um, I think that, you know, leaders often do burn out because when you think about it, when I was an individual contributor where my role was to just write my code and make sure I had adequate test coverage and get it deployed, there's a very great feedback loop, right? My code either works or it doesn't. Um, it passes the test or it doesn't. It's in production or it's not. When you're a leader, you don't have that much clarity. Like I do things that I hope will yield benefits in the next three to six months or even next year. And there's very little signal and a lot of noise. And as a leader, that lack of a feedback loop can be very frustrating. And I think that a big part of leadership is one, taking care of yourself. And again, taking care of your physical health, uh, taking care of the people that you care about and making sure that they those relationships are as rich as possible so that you, when you are at work, then you're taking care of a lot of the things that keep you going. Um, and, and I think that's really some of the best ways to, to just take care of the burden of leadership, right? I'm not going to have quick feedback loops. There are going to be things that I try that I won't even really know if they work. Things got better, but I'm not sure if that was really me. Um, but, you know, celebrate those wins. There are things that you will find as a leader and I found that I did this and I exactly saw the positive outcome either through the performance of my team or just the feedback I've gotten from my team. So um, celebrate those wins because they will often be few, those times where you can directly see a link between what you're doing uh, and the outcome. So uh, relish those opportunities. All right, Janine's asking, I'd love to know how you're managing the build relationships within your team during the lockdown. Yeah, um, I have a great answer for that. So I work at Help Scout and um, you go to helpscout.com, you can learn all about the, the company. Um, the, we've long done something called a FICA, F-I-K-A. Again, that's F-I-K-A, if you wanna Google it. It's a kind of a complicated um, idea, but it's from a Swedish practice of stopping and getting coffee and talking to people, right? Usually coffee, maybe a pastry. Um, and we're fully remote, so we do FICAs over Zoom. And it's just a great way to say, we're going to stop and spend 20 minutes. You know, you're wherever you are. Maybe you could be in London or New York City, and I'm here in Houston, and I'll have my coffee. You may have your tea, and we'll just chat. And the, the one rule I have is that let's not talk about work. We're going to talk about you and me and we and what we can do to better work with each other just as people, not again, work, but just, I know you a little bit better, you know me. Uh, and that's been a really great way to build relationships. And so I've been having a lot of FICAs with my team members, but other departments like, you know, I'm in engineering. So in marketing and in um, sales and support, and just, I've been FICAing, FICAing my face off is what people said. Um, and that's been really fantastic. So that's been a great tool. And I highly encourage you, if you can, to, to, to adopt the FICA concept. All right. Um, Leandri's asking, I have trouble knowing when to stop working, especially now working from home. When I get busy, it becomes hard to stop. I find I'm always telling myself just this one small thing, but end up working sometimes till two in the morning, but I can't seem to stop. Any advice? Yes. I would say that though. When you're working from home, and I've been working remotely for a long time, um, it is surprisingly easy to work a lot more than you did when you had to drive to an office. The important thing that I would say to help you with this is one, just have a simple to-do list or a simple backlog of here are the things I need to do today. And, and again, in general, we always think that there's 10 things, 10 things that I need to do today. And really, you probably got one, maybe two that you need to uh, actually get done. I mean, really valuable things. Just get those one or two things done and then say, look, you know, when I get these two things done, 
I'm going to go for a walk. I'm going to take a nap or I'm going to just have a nice lunch and reward myself. So really have a really good sense of what's the most valuable things uh, that you can do and just be easy on yourself and just say, look, I have two things that are really important that are going to move the needle forward and maybe one stretch goal and just be okay with that. And, and typically um, we often overestimate the impact that we have and it's usually okay. If you get one or two really impactful things done per day, that's amazing. If you say, well, you know, the work that I have to do can be done in one day, break it up. Say, this is phase one, phase two, phase three. I'll do phase one today, phase two tomorrow. Um, you have probably a lot more, um, you, you probably have a lot more control over what you can do than you think. I'm seeing in Slack that the keynote starting on stream one, uh, if you need to drop, that's fine. I'm going to keep going if people are still here. Uh, maybe I'm talking to ghosts, but I'm going to keep going. Uh, all right. So thanks for the great talk. Would a burnout retreat be a good idea? Allow a team member a day or two to disconnect from work, to breathe and get back on their feet. It's subtly different from a vacation. More of some time to implement your three most important takeaways. Yes, I, I totally agree. I think giving people time and, and, and not PTO, right? Not pay time off or, or, or vacation to say, you know what? This is a day and you'll need leadership to clear this up. I, I typically have enough leeway and I've built up enough. Um, I, my track record is usually good enough that I can pull this off. Look, you know, maybe not a full day, but half a day where you just look, don't don't do work. You know, it's not vacation, but do something. Maybe it's maybe you've been wanting to experiment with some framework like, uh, we, you know, we, let's say we're using Angular. You wanted to work in React, you know, take that day to do that. That's fine. Because, you know, typically by learning another framework, you better understand another one. Um, or maybe it's something that's just totally, you know, if you need to just hike through the mountains Friday mornings uh, or if you need to do something, I think by investing in the health of my teams, I'm investing in the work my team produces. And so I totally like that idea of taking a um, kind of a burnout retreat. Um, at Help Scout, we do a retreat twice a year in the spring and the fall. Our spring one was in Dublin and got canceled because of the virus. And so I was looking forward to that. So we fly 100 plus people to one place for a week retreat, a week long retreat. And that's just amazing. Uh, but you can not have to do it twice a year. I think you can do it more frequently. All right, Jamie, on the point of dealing with different personalities, each person will display burnout differently. Is there a way to identify the different representations of burnout? Also, as a manager, how do you approach your colleague if they want to approach you to deal uh, with possible burnout? Uh, you are correct. There are different ways to express burnout, though. I think the three dimensions that I talked about are almost always going to, to, to be there. I think that, um, again, it goes back to what's the baseline of my people? What is their kind of normal behavior and their normal profile? And then be, be keen and be able to uh, have your detectors going to detect deviations from that baseline. I think that uh, if your colleague won't come to you about burnout, then you probably don't have the relationship. Um, it's really important to build that relationship in advance. One of the first things I do as a manager is I heavily invest in relationships. I heavily invest day one, getting to know my teams because I know day 100, day 1000, when I need to have a hard conversation like about burnout, then it's there. And so I think that relationships have to lead the way. Uh, Jock, with the global pandemic and a lot of countries going on lockdown, how do I support my team? to prevent lockdown burnout. Yeah, at Health Scout, we're having lots of conversations about this. Uh, one way is, like I mentioned, FICAs, um, and really just the um, taking the time to spend time one-on-one -on -one with people. You can do a FICA um, anywhere, right? And I do them over Zoom. Um, I would say there are even uh, online games, and my team and I, we played a, a social game called Werewolf over Zoom, and it worked really well. But you can play backgammon, chess, checkers, online. Maybe say, hey, every Friday afternoon, we're going to get together, hop on Zoom. I assume everyone has Zoom or something like Zoom, and we're going to play online game together. And that's one way to just kind of, as a team, deal with lockdown burnout. All right, let me, uh, let me look at where we are. Okay, 
Great. All right. Katie's saying we need to wrap. Sorry for going over. Thank you, everyone. Um, hey, let's continue this conversation in Slack or on Twitter. Um, really easy to find on Twitter. It's just A-N-J-U-A-N. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, I look forward to continuing. I'm going to save this chat locally, and um, I can probably try to answer them uh, either in Slack or somewhere else. So, all right, everyone, take care.